next speaker is uh, Peter Schmelz, who is currently a Guggenheim Fellow. Congratulations, Peter. Uh, uh, Peter Schmelz is a musicologist specializing in the music of the 20th and 21st centuries with a special interest in the music of Russia, Ukraine, and the former Soviet Union. He received a PhD in the history and literature of music from the University of California at Berkeley. Professor Schmelz has written and published widely on a variety of topics in leading periodicals. His first book, Such Freedom, If Only Musical, Unofficial Soviet Music During the Thaw, was published by Oxford in 2009. Uh, won the ASCAP Deems Taylor Award in 2010, and his article, Valentin Silvestrov and the Echoes of Music History, published in the Journal of Musicology, received an ASCAP Deems Taylor Virgil Thompson Award in 2015. His book, Alfred Schnittke's A Concerto Grosso No. 1, uh, was published in 2019 by Oxford. Professor Schmelz is currently completing a book, Sonic Overload, Alfred Schnitka, Valentin Silvestrov, and Polystylism in the Late USSR, a monograph generously supported through the National Endowment for the Humanities Fellowship. His, uh, he currently serves as co-editor of Indiana University Press's Russian Music Studies series and has also served as editor of the Journal of Musicology from 2014 to 2016. He currently teaches in the School of Music at Arizona State University, Tempe. Before coming to Arizona, he taught at the University of Buffalo and Washington University in St. Louis, where he also served as chair of the music department. Let's give a, well, where, a very warm welcome to Professor Schmelz. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks to Louis Baston for arranging this wonderful conference. I'm really glad to be here. Um, I'm exhausted just hearing you read <laughs> <laughs> Too much. Okay. Just give me one more second to get situated. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Just give me a high sign if I need to talk louder. I can usually handle a room like this without a mic, but we'll see. Uh, this afternoon I will be talking briefly about the career of Valentin Silvestrov, one of Ukraine's leading contemporary composers. In my other writings about Silvestrov, I have been coming to terms with his career's zigs and zags and their larger implications for musical style and politics, as well as their implications for musical dissemination, reception, and identity in the late 20th and early 21st centuries. Today, I'm going to provide a synoptic account of Silvestrov's creative life, highlighting three key moments and three key compositions that illustrate his music's central themes. I hope that my comments will also provide useful background information for the two Silvestrov pieces that will be performed on the concert later tonight. Although my title stresses revolution, I am as concerned with continuities as with disruptions. This is why I added the word moment so many times to my title. The moment is a central idea for Silvestrov, appearing in a number of his titles since his 2003 Moments of Poetry and Music for Voice, Piano, and String Orchestra. As we will see, this opposition, if not dialectic, between change and stasis forms the basis for Silvestrov's aesthetics from the 1970s onward. But given the most recent history of Silvestrov in Ukraine, I would like to think about revolution as well, especially the inherent tension between political and aesthetic revolutions. A tension encapsulated by the famous remark that Anatoly Lunacharsky then head of Narkompros, or the People's Commissariat of Enlightenment, a comment that Lunacharsky made to Prokofiev in April 1918, when he and the Soviets were trying to move Prokofiev back to the USSR. Lunacharsky said, you are a revolutionary in music, we are revolutionaries in life, we ought to work together. 
this paradoxical linkage between revolutionary music and revolutionary politics confronted Soviet composers such as Slavestrov with particular acuteness in the 1960s. They thought that the new times in which they were living demanded a new musical language, yet did not consider themselves revolutionaries. By contrast, as Silvestrov later complained, those in power, and especially those in power in Ukraine, thought of the young composers in Kyiv and elsewhere as an ideological diversion. As Silvestrov said, neither he nor any of his colleagues, Igor Blaskov, Leonid Hrobovsky, who is here in the audience today, or Vitaly Vodziatsky, were politicians. It was those in power themselves who counted us as political, Silvestrov remarked. Yet by so pointedly avoiding politics in an environment in which everything was politicized, they were themselves willy-nilly adopting a political stance. So moment one. I tried to give as many translations as possible just to satisfy everyone that moves in my being on it. <laughs> one goal of this paper and of my ongoing research on Silvestrov is to recapture how prominent he was in the 1960s. I think we've lost sight of this. For those who argue that Soviet restrictions had little effect on music, Silvestrov's career, as well as those of conductor Igor Blaskov and his wife, musicologist Helena Makreva, and the other composers in Kyiv, offer potent counterexamples. These restrictions effectively stifled his career from 1970 on. And here's a picture of some of the composers uh, from Kiev with uh, visiting American at that point. Um, music writer Nicholas Slavimsky. Over the course of the 1960s, Silvestrov became more and more prominent on the world stage. His winning of a Kusevitsky Foundation grant in 1966 and a Gaudiamas Prize in 1970 serve as the clearest evidence. Yet his career in the West stands in stark contrast to Russian composer Edison Denisov's, for example. Silvestrov was never a self-promoter. He always relied on others, and particularly on Blaskov, to advocate on his behalf and to serve as his agent and publicist, helping to arrange performances both at home and abroad. Some examples of these foreign and domestic performances can be seen in this document from the Ukrainian Union of Composers. And this is an important document. I can't talk about this in any great detail here, but this is a document sent to the Central Committee of the Communist Party of Ukraine after Silvestrov and Hodziatsky had been expelled from that party at the end of 1970. So it really is this amazing moment when they're tracking what Silvestrov had been doing abroad mm -hmm. and letting the Central Committee know about it. None nonetheless, within the USSR, Silvestrov's fame arguably was greater than many of his colleagues. He appeared prominently, for example, in the youth periodical Unist, as well as the more interesting Krugazor, which means outlook or range of vision. Significantly, the only other young adventurous Soviet composer to appear in Krugazor at this time was Arvo Perret, but that's a topic for a different paper. First published in 1964, Krugazor was a monthly periodical for teenagers and young adults that included brief artic articles about a variety of music-related topics, although it also covered events of uh, more political importance, including audio postcards from areas around the world and news of the space race. Its more, most important claim to fame was its flexi discs. For each number of the periodical included six of these, each was double sided. I don't know if you remember these, maybe you're too old, probably, but they, they're like uh, uh, 45 size, right? But they're flexible, you could bend them on lightweight. And so each one of these issues had six of those. In April 1968, Sebastian featured on one of them, and this is a picture of the article that accompanied it. I don't have a picture of the disc, unfortunately. In a few minutes, we'll listen to an excerpt from this six-minute Krugazor flexi disc. But first, I want to underscore the value of this extremely rare sonic document. It presents singular evidence about Silvestrov from this period. There is no other recording of him speaking from the 1960s that I know of, unless someone in the room has a copy of the tape in there. Covered somewhere. Um, given how loquacious he has become in the past 15 or so years, it is strange to think how underdocumented his career is before around 1990. But Krugazor's sound clip for Silvestrov begins with the narr narrator banali explaining, many say that it is impossible to narrate music, but if worst comes to worst, the composer should have the privilege of describing the conception of his own music, which Silvestrov does for his Mysteria. The narrator refers to Silvestrov's mystery for alto flute and six groups of percussion, composed for well-known flute player and avant-garde proponent Severino Gazzoloni. 
who premiered the composition on 12 September 1965 at the Venice Biennale with Les Proposions de Strasbourg. Here's a copy of the LP release of that from 1969. Mysterio was also performed at the Prague Spring Festival in 1968, which as you well know is a notorious year for the festival and for the city in which it was held. The Prague performance appears to be the recording on the Krugazor Flexi Disc, a recording overshadowed at first by the descriptive narrative. After the narrator's introduction, as Mysteria plays in the background, we will hear a clip of Silvestro speaking. He bursts in, speaking very quickly, as he still does, his ideas cascading one after the other, rushing to come out. Silvestro says, like a single voice, and all the sounds are reconciled in a field or a forest, that is, in some kind of naive moment, from the white noise. White noise is when a noise contains every pitch, in that white noise. I'm not speaking about the scientific understanding, perhaps this isn't it. Personally, I noticed something when we were on a folklore expedition, and we were brought to some kind of farm, and we heard a kind of noise, and it turned out to be a remarkable combination. For somewhere in the distance, Chopin's piano concerto swelled very quietly, and that music did not sound from the depths separately. It was as if it being woven into that noise, it already joined the other parts of another orchestra. And that is also my personal basis for Mysteria. So I want to listen to that, but I realize I have to plug this in.
But then the orderly arrangement of this 12-tone um, technique begins to be interrupted as aleatory notation comes to dominate. And I love this a few pages later, and I really like this because I don't know if you can quite see it, but the fourth system down, well, the third note system says atonal, right, in question marks. So you're supposed to improvise that in an atonal sense. Uh, and if you really, if you were really paying attention, you could see that the, that the, uh, the vibraphone is actually doing the uh, retrograde of the very first row that the, uh, the flute was playing. So this part is still 12 tone at that moment, but it's also contrasting with these aleatory moments. So Vestrup himself thought of 12 tone composition as revolutionary. Speaking of hearing for the first time in the early 1960s, Anton Webern's Concerto for Nine Instruments, he said, it immediately astonished me. When I heard it, I had the feeling that I was listening to music perpendicularly, such a naive impression from a simple listener. Because despite all of their innovations, the ears still associated both Schoenberg and Baird with the 19th century. But from Webern, there immediately was the sense of a completely new world. Hearing music perpendicularly is a wonderfully evocative phrase. It is as if Silvestrov, a former resident of Flatland, has discovered another dimension or two. Yet although avant-garde at the time, like many compositions from the heyday of post-war serialism, Mysteria now sounds like a time capsule an evocation of the 1960s scientistic avant-garde. More than that, and more pertinent to Sylvester's own biography, it and his comments about it sound like a moment on the cusp. It was a moment on the cusp of many things. Above all, 1968 initiated a period of trauma for Sylvester and his colleagues. In the middle of the year, Blaskov was fired from his post at the Leningrad Philharmonic, where he had been one of Yevgeny Maravinsky's assistants. Later in 1968, Helena Makreva and his wife committed suicide. In 1970, Silvestrov and Hunziatsky, as I said, were both expelled from the Ukrainian Union of Composers after a disturbance started by Blaskov at a youth planet. And I've seen the archival documents for this. They make for a very grim reading, uh, but that's a story for another time. Silvestrov and Hunziatsky were readmitted to the Union in early 1973, but Silvestrov's ongoing financial difficulties became an impetus for his next, most momentous stylistic shift. The standard story of Sylvester's life gives central prominence to the music he completed during his time in professional limbo from 1970 through 1973. Important compositions such as his drama for violin, cello, and piano from 1970 to 1971, and meditation for cello and chamber orchestra from 1972. But there were other works from 1973 that proved equally pivotal, and I've given you a list of them right here. Most crucially, neither meditation nor drama include voices, and the human voice was to be one the most important catalyst for the next phase of Sylvester's career, the phase in which Kitsch, in his very specific understanding of the term, became prominent. I'll let Sylvester describe what happened next. In a remarkable interview he gave to a journalist in Berlin in September 2014, after the events of Euro Maidan, but first published only in late 2017, Sylvester described his next revolutionary discovery. He has told this story several times, including in an interview with me that I cite in my book, Sonic Overload, but I like the way he tells it in this version, so I'm gonna use this version instead. And I wanna give you a picture. This is the group of people that he's talking about. He said, we were young and often got together with friends to listen to music. And once we were listening to a record by the Beatles, Sgt. Pepper, and I suddenly heard that besides expression, it was after all very jivaya music, or lively and vivacious. We also would listen to Ella Fitzgerald, for example, but when you're drunk, you won't listen to Vapor. That's it. He likes that line, he uses that line a lot. He and his circle had gathered in the early 1960s to analyze and discuss 12-tone composition, but now their ears were turning elsewhere. Sylvester continued, and such popular Western music as the Beatles suddenly opened my eyes. I began to compose like crazy, like Iceland, some kinds of banal melodies, common little songs, without words, by the way. But for several, I selected words, and I even set an entire cycle, kick songs. It was the period of preparing for quiet songs. Here's a uh, transcription of the first page of the manuscript for the first of the kick songs. We'll listen to this in a minute or two. This also has not been published. But it should be noted that kick songs was not just preparation, for as Sylvester's manuscripts reveal, the, com the composition of kick songs and quiet songs overlap. Kick songs were written in 1973, Quiet songs were started in 1973, which most people don't notice. They say that he started in 74, but the archival um, documentation shows that he started the quiet songs in 1973. 
So Bestro added, in general, I suddenly cultivated an interest in weak music. When you ride in a taxi and you hear some kind of schlager or pop song from that time, even Soviet, it is, at all, it is after all very successful. Their melodies are somehow jivuya, alive or lively, so he really likes his word, right? At the same time, it's as if in a low style. I even started to record my new compositions on tape. My wife sang the kitsch songs from my sheet music. That tape is preserved somewhere, three songs to words by poets who are friends of mine. And then I explained to Edison and Denisov what happened. That for me, at that moment, in my avant-garde period, an intonational blockage arose. Thus, I accepted weakness, and I was free. It's a little disingenuous for him to say that he doesn't know where the tapes are because they're in the Paul Zucker archive. He sold that material to them. <laughs> Most notable is the language with which Sylvester chose to write his kitsch songs. All are in Ukrainian. Only one of the quiet songs is in Ukrainian, a setting of Shevchenko's Farewell, O World, that later would reappear in his music, including in his memorial for his wife, uh, Requiem for Larisa, from 1997. So let's listen to the first of the kitsch songs. Sebastian so is playing piano, Larissa Bondarenko, his wife is uh, singing. And here's the text. Oh, so 
poetic about Silvestrat's music. His own rhetoric and his own personality encourage it. Capturing a moment that you don't want to pass sounds lovely in the abstract. Silvestrat's aesthetic is anti-nostalgia. It is not nostalgia for it resists the passage of time that nostalgia requires. But in his own life, this anti-nostalgia becomes linked to specific times and specific places. At his moments of fame abroad but disrepute at home, of domestic music making in private spaces of imagined freedom. Taping a draft in these cases was an optimistic act. It looked forward, implying a completed future product, one that might be heard and responded to by the many. Now these drafts are our only glimpses backward of a past that has ineluctably faded, preserved somewhere only by technology, and by an automated mode of technology at that, now digitized flexi-discs, now digitized reel-to-reel -reel tapes. One of the notable taped sketches from 1973 is a song sung by Silvestrov himself called The Lament of Orpheus. Already in 1973, Silvestrov had assigned himself the role of the mythic bard, looking back, bidding farewell, but unable to let go, even as he was forced to let go. Silvestrov's so more recent politically inspired memorial pieces, including Maidan 2014, the later choral arrangement of those pieces he wrote in the midst of the revolution in early 2014. So there's this piece, and then there's also the songs written in memory of the singer Vasil Slipak, which we'll hear later this evening. These pieces put a new, tragic inflection on his ideas of capturing stasis with an unforgiving change. These compositions are weightier. Each performance is both farewell and memorial, a final farewell postponed. They also tie Silvestrov more strongly to Ukraine, connecting him to that time and that place. This connection was reinforced in, by the 2017 celebrations of Silvestrov in Kiev connected to his 80th birthday, including a performance of Maidan 2014 in the St. Catherine Lutheran Church. That's a picture of that performance right there. Yet Silvestrov's music crosses borders, it sneaks up on you. It has become a balm for frantic, frenetic times. As final examples, I want to point to Silvestrov's ongoing canonization worldwide. See, for example, Hélène Grimaud's album Memory, released by Deutsche Grammophon last year, which plays Silvestrov alongside familiar, dreamy music by Chopin, Debussy, Satie, and the contemporary British Indian musician Nitin Sani. Or one last example. 2016 ambient remix of Silvestrov's Farewell of World by Mexican producer Morkoff and French pianist Vanessa Wagner, which both washes out and, in its piano postlude, pays homage to the original. Play just one tiny clip of this. Silvestrov's identity as a Ukrainian composer, reawakened after 2014, pushes against this new kind of relevancy, a relevancy based on Silvestrov being out of time, timeless, moving forward while looking warily back. Thank you. Thank you.